This week, Israel stands determined to eliminate Hamas after the October 7th Islamic extremist terrorist attack. There is also a very, very clear sense of determination of all Israeli society that now is the time to crush them once and for all. In a week that brought President Biden's promise of support and Gaza's self-inflicted horror, we speak with a top Israeli diplomat about what lies ahead. Strategically, what is it that you think Israel must do in the coming weeks, months, and maybe even years? Even as America's military force arrives in the region. There is growing concern about a war on two fronts. An outbreak on the border of Lebanon could bring the terrorist group Hezbollah and America into the fight. How concerning is that to you? It keeps me awake at night. This week, a look at the trigger that may have the U.S. enter an expanding war in the Mideast. And with the threat that terrorism may erupt all over the globe, there is a real reason to look at a growing menace within our own borders. Those military-age males might cause the same terrorism in our own nation that is being caused in the Middle East right now. We examine the threat within. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We begin with the war in the Mideast, prospects that it could expand beyond Israel, and the impact on the U.S. Hundreds of thousands of Israeli troops are awaiting orders to launch a ground assault on Gaza, the strip of Palestinian-controlled land on the southwest corner of Israel along the Mediterranean Sea. It's been two weeks since the Islamic extremist terror group Hamas attacked Israel from Gaza, killing and injuring thousands. Today, we speak with Eliav Benjamin, Deputy Ambassador of Israel to the United States. Strategically, what is it that you think Israel must do in the coming weeks, months, and maybe even years? So we came out declaring and, and stating that our objective with, uh, with this war, which was forced upon us, is once and for all to get rid of Hamas. And when we say getting, getting rid of Hamas, it means the, the goal being um, having Israeli citizens feel safe and secure, not just those who live around Gaza who deserve it the most, but everybody around Israel. But the, and the way of going about it is decapitating the ability of Hamas for um, ever carrying terrorism activities against Israel again, number one. Number two is basically um, taking away their ability to control Gaza. And the, the goal for us is to make sure that they do not govern there because their governance affects Israel and is threatening and has been threatening Israeli cities, villages, neighborhoods and citizens around the country. If the enemy is willing to hit civilians and not follow any rules, but you're expected to never do that while they're using human shields around their munitions and areas they'd like to protect, how can you successfully prosecute a war? It's a good question, Sharon. We adhere to the international law. We adhere to international humanitarian war while we are at war. I could stoop down as low as Hamas. It's not the way that we operate. We are a humane society the, by Jewish law, but even by any human law, logical law, which is who we are and, and what we are. So while we are fighting the terrorists and fighting Hamas and pushing them back and crushing them as strongly as we possibly can, we are also doing our utmost to keep uh, innocent civilians out of harm's way. And um, anything short of that is, is not Israel. I suspect you might say that one reason the U.S. cares and should care about what happens to Israel is just a matter of we are like-minded on many things, that Israel is a strong ally. But what are the practical reasons you would tell Americans? So naturally, there is the, the very close bond between Israel and the United States, between Israelis and Americans. But it's not just that. It, it, um, it definitely is far more than that, especially with such an attack now. When we're saying that what Hamas is doing is worse than ISIS, or that this is our 9-11 times 12 times, if you take the proportion of, uh, of population, this resonates 
but it doesn't make it doesn't need much persuading from uh, from our end uh, for it to resonate, because Hamas is not just after Israelis. It's not just after Jews. There were at least 41 nationals or nations whose people within Israel were either killed or injured or kidnapped by Hamas with what they raided on uh, October 7th. 41 nationals at least. So, yes, today it's Israel. Tomorrow it could be any other country or any other citizen of any other country around the world. And this why this does and should resonate also with, uh, with Americans. There is some criticism in the United States, as I'm sure you've heard, that the botched American withdrawal from Afghanistan, unfreezing money for Iran that the United States had control of, in essence paying or trading for hostages. Do you think any of that or any perceived weakness on the part of American leadership made it seem to Hamas like this was a time to attack? It's difficult for me to become a psychologist for Hamas and to try and explain what their motives were, but I don't think the, I don't think the American part of the equation was, was taken into consideration. For instance, looking at um, the events unfolding in Israel over the past 10 months, over the whole what's known as the judicial reform process and internal debate, and uh, sometimes even unrest, thinking that this is the weakest uh, Israel that they've ever found and this is the right time to strike. They were looking at the whole normalization process that Israel, with, led by the United States, of course, is conducting with the Arab world, and in particular now with, with Saudi, thinking that they could jeopardize this because any normalization with the Arab world, again, goes against the extremists. It goes against Hamas. So this is their intention, perhaps, to derail um, these, uh, these things as well, which, again, is a wrong calculation because all our Arab friends, even if they won't come out publicly, unfortunately, in saying so, they are against Hamas. They are against this, this extremism. They are against terrorism throughout. And they're in favor of Israel fighting and crushing, crushing Hamas. If the goal is to decapitate Hamas once and for all, is this something that you envision takes weeks, months, or years? It took the U.S. four years to take out ISIS, and it's still at it. And we're, the whole world is still, is still at it, but led by the United States. True, spread all over, but we know where they were, they were focused more or less. It could easily take, and it will easily take weeks. Whether it takes months or years, it's difficult to know, because unfortunately, there are Hamas cells all over. There are Hamas cells in Lebanon, there are Hamas cells in Turkey, there are Hamas cells in, uh, in Qatar, and prob probably in other countries as well. Um, and I'm not even talking about those terrorists who may still be in Israel after infiltrating on, uh, on October 7th. So it could take a while, but we are determined May the price be as it, as it may. What we've done over the years, when we had what's known or nicknamed the cycles of violence, we kind of put a patch on it, put a band-aid on the situation. It was probably a mistake at the time, because this allowed over the years for Hamas to continue arming itself and um, financing itself and training its operatives, together, of course, with the backing of Iran and other good friends of theirs. Um, Maybe we should have done this uh, years ago, and then we wouldn't have reached this horrific attack that they, uh, that they conducted on, on October 7th. But there is also a very, very clear sense of determination of all Israeli society that now is the time to crush them once and for all. Ahead on full measure, another Israeli neighbor threatens to expand the Mideast conflict. With Israel's ground war with Hamas and Gaza in the beginning stages, many are keeping a close eye on the next terrorist threat to Israel's north, the Islamic extremist Hezbollah in Lebanon. Our Scott Thuman has reported for full measure from both Lebanon and the contested northern border with Israel. He takes a look at the second front. Israeli artillery fire. 
no longer just south into Gaza, but north along the country's border into neighboring Lebanon. For the past week, this area has seen intensified exchanges of rockets and artillery, shots in what could become a wider war in the Middle East, raising the stakes for the rest of the world. While the terror group Hamas controls Gaza, here in the north, the threat is from Hezbollah, another terrorist group with ties to Iran and a major political power in Lebanon. The group is thought to have at least 20,000 well-armed and trained fighters, with more that can be called up to fight. In 2006, a 34-day war between Israel and Hezbollah forces left hundreds dead and wounded on both sides. When Full Measure visited Israel's northern border two years ago, the area had just been attacked by Hezbollah rockets. From the top of Mount Dove, Lieutenant Colonel Amnon Scheffler described the threat matrix then. It has a lot to do with Iran. Iran is the sponsor for Hezbollah. Iran continues to bring uh, the precision-guided missiles know-how and capabilities. Um, and that is something that we are trying to stop. Since Hamas's devastating surprise attack on Israel October 7th, this northern border area has become much more dangerous. Israeli army patrols run from house to house. Civilians have been evacuated. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner is a spokesman for the Israeli Defense Forces. We understand, what we understand at this time is that Hezbollah is actually operating in order to increase and um, expand and per perhaps even uh, broaden the scope under the direction of Iran. And that is a cause of concern. Concerns over a larger war, a big part of the reason President Biden made a visit to Israel, showing support, but also reminding Iran that America is watching. In Washington, despite dysfunction and disunity over almost everything, when it comes to Israel and the threat of an escalating Middle East war, lawmakers on both sides say they're worried. Republican Congressman Randy Weber from Texas spent years on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And I'm told, too, you probably hear the same things, that the rockets that Hamas has are not near as sophisticated as the ones Hezbollah has. And we're already seeing Hezbollah in the north, and you're already seeing Israel evacuate towns and cities because they're preparing for a two-front war. What about Israel's stance that it has unilateral authority, that if that threat reaches uh, untenable level, that they can bomb Iran? When someone says they want to kill you, believe them, especially in this instance, I've watched this develop for a long time, especially when you're, develop, when you're, when you're dealing with a country full of killers who have made it their aim, and they're not shy about announcing it. America is the number one Satan, according to the Iranians. Israel is the number two Satan, according to the Iranians. They want to take out Israel, and they're just as intent on wanting to take us out. A former Army Ranger, Democrat Congressman Jason Crow from Colorado, served three tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and was awarded the Bronze Star. What would a wider war mean, and how concerning is that to you? Well, it keeps me awake at night, there's no doubt about it. You have a lot of very well-armed powers in that region, and um, uh, the casualties would be unacceptable, right? Uh, there's a lot of combat power in the Middle East, uh, and a wider conflagration is something that nobody wants to see. Uh, there would be a lot of military casualties, in my view, uh, but uh, just as importantly, there would be tens of thousands of civilians who'd be caught in the middle, and, and already are caught in the middle of this fighting. How do we keep Iran and Hezbollah out of this. We have to surge uh, additional military resources into the region. We have to send a message to Iran and others that if they want to escalate, this is not going to go well for them, that we have the ability and capability on hand to respond and, and uh, impose costs on them uh, if they are going to aggress further. The USS Gerald R. Ford and its strike group are now in the eastern Mediterranean. A second aircraft carrier, the USS Eisenhower, is on its way. 2,000 Marines have also been placed on standby. The U.S. and European nations have called on their citizens to leave Lebanon as soon as possible. Can the United States do much to tamp this down? Well, it's a little late. We've talked about President Biden. He needs to exude confidence 
and support for Israel. He needs to make absolutely, unequivocally apparent that the United States has Israel's back. As the fighting in Gaza enters its third week, it is clear Israel and the U.S., while hoping to contain the crisis, are preparing in case what is for now just regional or suddenly becomes more global. So there is that concern about the possibility of American troops being called upon to fight there. Very much so, and the idea of U.S. boots on the ground there right now, according to the administration, isn't being seriously considered. And the lawmakers we spoke to on Capitol Hill share concerns about any major U.S. involvement. And it's worth remembering that 40 years ago this week, U.S. Marines stationed in Beirut, Lebanon, were attacked by suicide bombers. 241 Americans died in that attack. Great context for all of this. Thanks a lot, Scott. Coming up, new concerns about foreign threats at our own southern border. The invasion of Israel by the Islamic extremist terrorist group Hamas was well orchestrated at a border called the Gaza Strip. Here in the U.S., at least four million people have crossed illegally, a large number, young men, convicted criminals, and even terrorists. When a fraction of them started ending up in New York, it finally captured concern among many who had promoted it as a sanctuary state. And now the city hardest hit by the last large-scale terrorist attack on America finds growing calls to deal with the threat within. Lisa Fletcher reports from New York. With there being a new international terrorism, specifically in Israel, my constituents and I are tremendously anxious that those military age males especially, uh, who are uh, coming across our borders illegally, might cause the same terrorism in our own nation that is being caused in the Middle East right now. Congressman Nick LaLota is worried that an attack like that in Israel could happen here because the threat is already within the gates. I'm extremely concerned right now that America has lost its focus specifically as it relates to the southern border and allowing folks into our country who might seek to accomplish an event like 9-11. At least 160 people on the terror watch list were stopped by Border Patrol for trying to cross from Mexico to the U.S. illegally this year. That's a sharp increase over 98 people during the previous year. For those who do cross over illegally, many find safe haven in sanctuary cities that have promised not to cooperate with federal officials to deport them. Do sanctuary cities play a role in this flood of migrants that we're seeing? Yeah, this is a magnet that's bringing people across our southern border and is only exacerbating the crisis. More than 170 counties across 11 states, as well as the nation's capital, have policies that shield illegal immigrants from federal immigration enforcement. And those policies come at a cost. Taxpayers spend billions to cover essential services for illegal immigrants like housing, food, and transportation. Lalota is the co-sponsor of a bill to stop the bailout for sanctuary cities. I am not here to make friends. I am here to make things right. He isn't alone in the call to cut New York City off from funding. Some parts of the city want to cut themselves out of the Big Apple itself. Scott Lobito wants the flood of illegal border crossers arriving in New York City from the southern border to stop. That's how it changes. That's how we're doing in Staten Island. Yeah. Lobito is from Staten Island, one of the five boroughs that make up New York City. Ground zero is Texas with this whole illegal immigration thing. But Staten Island is ground zero for the fix. Since 2022, more than 110,000 undocumented foreigners have poured into New York City, forecasted to cost $12 billion to house and care for them over the next three years. New York City Mayor Eric Adams recently returned from a trip to Mexico and South America, where he delivered a message. There is no more room in New York. It's estimated that 300 to 500 asylum seekers are arriving in New York each day. The city is putting them in housing as varied as luxury hotels and tent cities. When those spaces filled, some landlords capitalized on the crisis. 
94-year-old Korean War veteran Frank Tamaro was one of more than 100 seniors kicked out of their senior center in March. He now lives with his daughter. The building owner reportedly found it more profitable to take a city contract to house illegal immigrants. A lot of people are looking at this from the outside and they're saying, here's a man in his 90s and now he's displaced from his home. They let me down, the politicians and all. I don't think it was right. Some Staten Islanders are making a startling pitch to secede from New York City and set up their own city government from Congressional Representative Nicole Malatakis. Let Staten Island secede. To Staten Island Borough President Vito Fasella. As somebody who supported secession in the past, it's got to be a serious, deliberate conversation. Staten Island isn't the only borough feeling the sting. Queens, nicknamed the world's borough because it's the most diverse county in the U.S., is bearing the brunt of the illegal immigration crisis in New York, with at least 39,000 settling there since last year. Tucked behind this brick wall is a tent city, built on the grounds of a state psychiatric center. It houses about 1,000 illegal immigrants per night. There is no plan for this. We're expected to deal with it and accept it and roll over and play dead. Joe Concanon is a retired New York City policeman and lives in the neighborhood. Like Scott Lobito, Concanon is also rallying his community to push back against unenforced immigration laws. It's bad enough we have the president who's not supporting border security and, and starting this from its beginning, right? And then it works its way up to New York now because the mayor and, and the governor of New York State have, have proclaimed that we're a sanctuary state, we're a sanctuary city. You know, this isn't law. Back on Staten Island, Scott Lobito encourages the asylum seekers to go home and fight for the freedoms that Americans enjoy. What happens tomorrow if one billion asylum seekers want to come here? Just let them in? Where's the limitation? Most of them are young military age men who should be fighting their own regime in their own country, being men. And in the city where the memorial for the 9-11 terrorist attack shines every anniversary as a pledge to never forget, it is also a reminder to remain on guard. I think a couple of decades ago, many Americans were fearful that folks illegally crossing our borders would merely steal their jobs, but now the stakes are much, much higher. For Full Measure, I'm Lisa Fletcher in New York City. And after a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, the U.S. has recently sent billions of dollars in military aid to Israel and Ukraine for their defense, but recruiting to keep our own military strong is said to be in a crisis state. We examine what's behind our recruiting problems and how the Pentagon is looking to reverse the trend on the next Full Measure. See you next week.